This week, we began exploring some of the early theoretical approaches to the study of human sexuality. Beginning in the 19th century, scientists began looking at sexuality as a topic worthy of scientific inquiry. Probably the best known of the early sexologists was Sigmund Freud, and despite the critiques of his work, there are two important contributions for us to keep in mind. Freud argued that sexual orientation and gender identity were achievements. We achieve our gender identity and sexual orientation as part of a sexual development process. And Freud also argued that gender identity and sexual orientation were achieved in the same moment. We also talked a little bit more in depth about the work of Alfred Kinsey, who was interested in documenting, describing, and categorizing sexual behavior. In addition, Kinsey created the Kinsey Scale, also known as the Heterosexual Homosexual Experience Scale, which ranked individuals in categories from exclusively heterosexual to exclusively homosexual. One of Kinsey's key findings was that very few people were on either end of the scale, that most of us fall somewhere in between. Finally, we looked at the work of Masters and Johnson, whose human sexual response cycle outlined four stages of sexual response, the excitement phase, the plateau phase, orgasm, and the resolution phase. We moved from sexology to an exploration of how Marxism and his theories of capitalism were applied to the study of sex and sexuality, specifically in the 1960s and 70s. If you recall, we looked at three different approaches scholars have used when applying a Marxist frame to the study of human sexuality, that being capital, commodification, and consumption, the materialistic conception of history, and emancipation and the politics of struggle. Each of these approaches explored the ways in which power dynamics related to economic structures tied in with our notions of sex, gender, and sexuality. And we looked at the contributions of feminism to the study of human sexuality, specifically Western feminism that emerged from the second wave feminist movement in the 1960s and 70s. If you recall, we stressed that this was a large, varied, and complex movement with multiple positions and no single theoretical contribution related to human sexuality, but rather multiple approaches to looking at human sexuality. We also talked about the way in which feminist and feminist movements brought attention to issues that were previously ignored, including sexual assault and violence, reproductive health and care, sexual harassment, and domestic violence. The readings for this week ran parallel to the mini-lectures, although Seidman does focus slightly more on the biological aspect of sexology and the more social aspects of theories from Marxist and feminist framing. Therefore, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the assigned readings for this week, and I'll jump into your final thoughts. For the ending of this discussion period, I'd like you to reflect on the following. Since the emergence of the early sexologists in the 19th century, Scholars have looked at human sexuality from a variety of disciplinary lenses. Of the theories explored this week, which were the most compelling to you, and why? Were any of these theoretical approaches problematic? Why? And do you think disciplinary framing matters? Explain. I look forward to reading your thoughts and ideas.